Hello, hello, hello. Can you listen something? Can you hear something? Maybe it's not ice. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Okay, great. You can hear? Not much. But I don't have. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, now I think you are hearing me because I can hear myself. Hello, is it okay? Is it fine? I'm getting things you said two minutes ago. Two minutes ago? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it might be it is taking some time. What? Yeah, it is taking some time to yeah, stream some and something like that. Right? Okay. The virus is normal. Yeah, yeah. I think. Shut it down. Why is there a cat in my Google Chrome icon? No, no, because I was registering the cat. Huh? Huh? You were registering the cat. No, it was just the avatar and the name of our video. Is this the only thing you have to come for this one? Maybe we could start. Oh, so what you're streaming is the um, chat? You are streaming now the PowerPoint. Now the, the yeah. When it's coming nearby there, I stream. Oh, so you're the director. Please start. Go ahead. This part is the protective records.
Should, should we start? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, myself, Krishnan Shekhawat. I am a mathematician. I did my PhD from University of Geneva. And now I am here at DCG Group as a postdoc fellow. So I'm working in the guidance of Professor Jose. So during my PhD, I worked on some of the architectural problems and I found it very interesting. So that's why, yeah, I have started working on the, some of the architectural problem. Okay, so, so yeah, I am trying to figure out the relation between the mathematics and architecture. So I can, I want to, yeah, just present that how mathematics can be helpful or in some parts it can be helpful to obtain the architectural designs or to solve some of the problem of the architects. So we are going to see some, we are going to see this presentation in the part. So the first part is automation. So how mathematics is helpful in automation. Uh, then the justification that if we manage to have some solutions, so why these solutions are good, why the others are not good. So, so justify using some mathematical tools. Then obviously, which is very common, the optimization. So I'm going to present some optimization tools, which would be helpful for the architectural designs. And the last is the classification. So if we have many, many solutions, so how we can classify that, which one is better or how to compare them. So we are going to talk about these four points. So we'll start with a problem. So let's say that we have given some kind of the rooms or the rectangular pieces. So here are precisely 16 rectangular pieces and we have the area inside each of the rectangular box. So which means that that is the area of the rectangular box. And here is the other shape. So we need to fit the given rectangular pieces into this non rectangular shape. So at this stage, this problem doesn't seem complicated. It is close to the space allocation problem. So where we need to fit these these rectangles inside the given shape. So obviously if we give these rectangular pieces to any child and if he start playing, so he managed to fit these pieces inside the given shape. But we can try to make this problem more architectural. So let's say that we have given the 16 architectural spaces. So first four rectangles are rooms with their areas. Then we have two bathrooms, two WC, a dining room, a kitchen, two offices, a library, a living room, a playing room, and an entrance hall. So we have these 16 architectural spaces and we have to fit them inside the rectangular, inside the given shape. So this problem now seems a bit architectural, but still something is missing. So we have one more thing, which is normalized number of trips. <clears throat> so this is a matrix, we call it a weighted adjacency matrix, where we have the numbers from zero to 10. So many of you have already seen this type of the matrix. So it gives the normalized number of the trips. So for example, if we have a big hospital and we have a room of nurse, a doctor and a patient, and we count the number of the trips between the nurse and patient and nurse and doctor. And if we find that the number of trips between the nurse and the patient is more than the number of trips between the nurse and the doctor, then obviously we prefer that the room of nurse should be close to the patient. So this is how we have this kind of the observations that we have some kind of the preferences. And if the number is 10, which is the highest number, which means that we want these two spaces close enough. 
But if the number is very small, then obviously we are not interested that this number should be quite close. So now we have the given rooms, we have the given shape, we have these normalized number of the trips. So the problem is to so the problem is to automatically arrange the given the given rectangles. So the problem is to arrange the given rectangles or the given rooms inside the given shape while satisfying the weighted adjacency matrix. So the idea is to automate the process, the automation, and we can add one more constraint that there should be some kind of the extra spaces inside the obtained solution because we are planning that the dimension, we are not going to change the dimension of the rooms, so that would be the fixed. And since we can see that in a big house, we have some corridors or terraces, balcony. So the algorithm automatically generates some extra spaces which can be used as corridors or the terraces. So the problem is to automate the process while satisfying the weighted adjacency matrix and it should have some extra spaces. Okay, so here are some of the issues which, which in this automation section we are going to discuss. So the first problem is to automate the process which already seems a little bit complicated. Then we don't have So we need to automate the process. The next thing is we don't have any idea about the position of the rooms. Like if we consider the U shape, so we don't know that which room should come into the center, which should come above, which should be below. And we have to automatically give the position to each of the rooms. The next one is to satisfy the weighted adjacency matrix. And the last, which is most complicated for us, especially for the mathematician to satisfy the architects. Because we tried many times that we found that we managed to solve the problem, some optimization tools, some theorems, and very excited that yes, we have some results. And when we present it to architects, they say that it is of no use, why you have done this. So this is the most difficult part that because it's hard to understand how they think what they like, what they don't like. So the most difficult part in all this problem is to satisfy the architects or to have the results which they like. Okay, so the problem is to, the problem is to fit the given rooms inside the given shape while satisfying the weighted adjacency matrix such that the obtained solution should have some extra spaces, some corridors or some extra spaces. So this problem is, it seems very, very complicated and very big. So what we thought is to decompose the problem into the smaller problems and then attack each part and then at the end, combine all the parts to have the final solution. So first step is to decompose the given shape into the rectangles. It means that we are considering only those shapes which we manage to partition or to decompose into the rectangles. Like in this shape, we have the U shape and we manage to decompose it in, into the rectangles. So now we can see that this U shape is in the five rectangles. We manage to partition into the five rectangles. So now what we can do is that we have like given rooms we can divide them into the five groups. So we have like 16 rooms in this particular case. We can divide them into the five groups. And for each group, we can obtain the rectangular arrangement. And then we combine or we adjoin these rectangular arrangements to have this kind of the shape. 
so the first stage is to partition the given rooms into the groups the next is to Okay, then we can. Yeah, let's see. So the first thing is the groups. The next thing is to. Yeah, if it's creating a lot of problems, so we can try. So I won't fully screen it, so maybe it, it would go better. Okay. So moving toward the solution. So first thing is to divide them into the groups. So in this case, we are going to divide them into the five groups. Then for each group, we should try to obtain a rectangular block and then in the end adjoin all the rectangular blocks to have the desired solution. So this is the first step that we need to divide them into the five groups. So here the weighted adjacency matrix will come into the picture. So we'll use the weighted adjacency matrix to form these groups. So we have written an algorithm which take this weighted adjacency matrix as input and deliver the number of the groups. So we can say that we have the five groups and by looking at the groups, you can see that we have quite managed to satisfy the weighted adjacency matrix. Like in the group five, we have offices and library. In group four, we have dining room and kitchen. Together in group three, we have living room and entrance hall. Then group two, two rooms, bathroom, WC, and the group one, two rooms, bathroom, WC, and the playing room. So now we have these five groups. So next is to obtain the rectangular block for each of the group. So now we manage to obtain the rectangular blocks. So I will discuss later that the algorithm behind developing these rectangular blocks. And once we have these rectangular blocks, then we can obtain this kind of the solution, which looks like the U-shape solution. Okay, so the rectangular blocks, first we'll discuss how we obtain these rectangular blocks. So the algorithm is not very complicated. So we start with any of the shape, any of the rectangular piece, let's say this is the first one, then we draw the second one above it. So let this is the second one. And every time we want that the overall composition should be rectangular. So we introduce an extra space. So these white rectangles are the extra spaces. Then we draw the third one. And again, if the composition is not rectangle, so we draw some extra space, then the fourth one. So it means that we are moving clockwise or the anti-clockwise direction, and we are introducing these extra spaces. So it serves the two purposes that once we have this rectangular composition, always it is sure. The other thing is that somehow we manage to introduce the corridors or the terraces inside the house or inside the big hotel or the restaurant or whatever is what we want. So using this algorithm, we managed to have these rectangular pieces. And then we had joined these five rectangular pieces to obtain the final solution. So this is construction. One more thing is that since like we are moving the spiral like this, but there are many other possibilities that we can go like this also or we can go in the different ways also. So it means that 
these rectangular blocks can be obtained in eight different ways. So that's why we are calling it eight spirals, spiral one, spiral two, spiral three. So it means that these rectangular blocks can be obtained in eight different ways. I'm not going into details is this. So till now we tried to manage to automate the process that we have the given some rooms and automatically we manage to fit them inside the inside the given shape while satisfying the weighted adjacency matrix. So it means that somehow we manage to optimize the connectivity, but still there exist a lot of algorithms for the rectangular floor plans. So the question is that why we have used this particular algorithm which works like this to obtain the rectangular floor plans we can, because we can use some other one also and we have used them and fit this in this process. So that's why this comes like before this automation is more about the algorithms, but this part is more mathematical that we need to justify that why we are using this or why we are doing this and why it is better than the other solution. So to justify, we have introduced the concept of connectivity. So let's say that we have two rectangular floor plans having the same spaces like this. So we can obtain its graph, which is not complicated. So this is one, two, three, and one and three is connected to four. And in this case, it is even more obvious one, two, three, and four. So in this case, the number of edges is five. And in this case, the number of edges is three. It means that if we compare the connectivity on the basis of number of edges, then we can say that this solution is better connected than this one. So we managed to prove a theorem which says that any rectangular floor plan can have at most three n minus seven edges. So let's say that if n is equal to five and we introduce the fifth one here, something like this. So n is equal to five. So it means that 15 minus seven is equal to eight. So the rectangular floor plan can have at most eight edges. So you can try to play with the rectangles if you are interested and you can see that it is impossible that if you have the five rectangles, so the number of edges can be more than eight. It is always equal to eight or it is always less than equal to eight. And if we count the number of edges in the rectangle four plan we propose, so we'll see that it is always equal to three and minus seven, which shows that the solution we proposed are best connected. So mathematically, because we have to figure out that how it is helpful for architects or not, but mathematically, we managed to prove that the solution which we proposed are best connected. So in this sense, we justify that what we are doing is mathematically quite good. And we managed to optimize the connectivity also. So first part is automation. The next one is
means that in total we can obtain about 4 million different solutions. So that's the power of the computer that by making very, very small changes, we can obtain 4 million different solutions. And yeah, then we leave up to the architects that they can go through all the solutions, they can pick whatever they want. And yeah, we can go like this. But yeah, at somehow we found that 4 million is a very big number. So at the same time, you need to provide some techniques to reduce the number of the solutions or like we can provide some methods like if we have so many solutions so we can count that the amount of the sunlight they are getting the whole year so we can give the mathematical number that okay this much is getting the sunlight this one so we can define these type of the criteria and then architects can pick that okay for this building i want this criteria to be satisfied and if other is not satisfied i am happy so we can try to manage to have the different criteria so that you have many options and then on the basis of the particular criteria you can pick one solution among four million solutions so we call this term as covariant that if we need to compare two architectural designs we need some numbers mathematical numbers so we call them covariants this is the adjacency graph of the plus shape floor plan, which I already have shown you this plus shape floor plan. It's the adjacency graph. So we have defined the adjacency among the, among the rooms, even if there is extra space between them and from them, we can obtain this adjacency graph. So I'm showing this adjacency graph because we are cal we have calculated most of the covariants which are graph covariants which are related to the graph so let's see this is the plus shape floor plan so very interesting life if we have the very big hotel which has 200 rooms so we can produce a kind of the graph which can show that the shortest path between two rooms like in this case if we have to look between dining room and office 2 so from dining room, we can go to room three, then library and then office two. So we can have like the shortest path. Similarly, the cut vertex. So cut vertex is a vertex. Like if we delete that vertex, so it will partition the solution into the two different parts. Like in this case, if we delete R3, then kitchen and dining room won't be connected to the remaining part. So it is like it is connecting the two parts. So these are the different kind of the covariants which we have introduced. Some may be very helpful or interesting for the architects. Some may not be, but yeah, we try to introduce a lot of the covariants. So here, like the list of the covariants which we have introduced. So this is what I was talking about that like if we have the 4 million solutions and it is hard to pick the one. So this is one of the solution having the least area. So out of the 4 million solution, you can obtain one solution and you can say that, okay, I want that which have the least extra spaces. Again, you can make some changes, but like we can propose the solution which has the least area. And every time we obtain the different solution, they have different positions for the room. Sometimes the library is on the outer part, but sometimes it is inside, the offices are on the outer part. So it, it gives you a lot of options to choose. And then you can pick one of the options. Okay, so this might be more interesting for you. So during this whole process, we managed to obtain a kind of the a piece of the software. It is not working, like it is not considering many aspects, but it's still it is, it is working quite good. So we call it computer generated plus shape architectural designs. The whole software is written in the processing. So it has like 16 different tabs. And when we run it, okay, so when we run it, the screen is not full, but it automatically generates, like it takes the input and it automatically generates the plus shape floor plan and its graph. 
the generating the floor plan is not that difficult but to define to let the computer know that which one are the adjacent like if there is an extra space between them then you have to consider it adjacent or not yeah it was a bit complicated but yes so this is like you can give the input so we have an external input file so we have this file so it you can give the weighted adjacency matrix in this input file then you can give the areas and you can decide the position of each group even if you can decide the the ratio between width and height so here we consider close to the golden ratio and the spirals like there are eight spirals so which one you want so you can give the input and it produce this solution which i have shown you on the screen but at the same time it generates an output file which has many many things so it is like it is giving you the groups the number of the extra spaces the area then adjacency matrix then degree of all rooms uh, then eigen values characteristic polynomial i'm not going into the details these are mathematical terms but yeah they can be helpful then the chromatic number distance matrix all the shortest path and after the shortest path there are many more things like the centricity the diameter the radius the moment of inertia the graph is bipartite or not so it automatically so once you give the input it automatically generates the solution one more interesting thing about this solution is that so we have created an option that okay if you are not happy with this like you want that this playing room should be close to the living room you don't want this in this group so you can make a change here and my making that change so here you can make a change and after that you can have the desired solution like the playing room would be close to the living room so earlier the playing room was here where the mouse was and now it is close with the living room so a little bit about the future work so in this we, we have seen that we mostly consider the rectangles but yeah maybe like the triangles or the hexagons other things would be interesting for the architect so so in future i can try to work with the other shapes also i want to generalize this software introduce some optimization tools if possible i want to see that how this solution look like in 3d but the most important is architectural input because that's why i'm here because i am doing it's first time i am presenting my work in front of the architects i don't know how they react what they like what they don't like but to proceed further i need more input from the architects because if i keep going on going on at the end of the day the work is of no use so there is no point in doing that work so yeah so that was the most important point which i am looking forward at dcz so that i can get a lot of inputs and i can work further thank you very much for the attention great <laughs> uh, this is a very uh, demanding job in terms of uh, trying to automate the architectural creative process really demanding because um, there are a, a lot of things uh, at stake uh, which are not simply um, or as simple as solving a functional uh, problem. And anything related with um, automate, uh, automation starts from uh, defining a set of assumptions. Those assumptions are usually wrong. Yes. Okay. Uh, 
Um, also, uh, there are other issues related to this composition, which is not uh, as simple as aesthetic. It can be other than, than that. So the, the, the composition problem in art architecture is also related to the engineering uh, uh, problem in the sense that the, the structure of the, of the building uh, defines a, um, um, a structural uh, uh, composition design or vice versa. Okay? Uh, that means that by working in this way, you eliminate the uh, composition structure. Um, so there's an, an assumption towards the problem that eliminates something which is very important in the definition of and, uh, not just the, the, the house space, but uh, the building uh, as a whole. So we, we can later talk about the, the problem of composition because it can also be uh, computed in many ways. I'm just talking about assumptions now, okay? So there is an assumption here that the composition problem is not part of the problem. Okay. Um, another assumption is that um, all spaces are closed spaces and materially connected with some distribution or other. Yes. Um, in fact, many of those spaces can themselves be used also as distribution spaces and the way they work well as dis distribution spaces or not depends very much on their position. So it's not just a question of having a specific uh, uh, position in, in, in the adjacency uh, uh, graph, it's also how the relation is, is created in terms of di di dimension. Yes. Um, Another thing is that many times uh, some spaces can have, um, let's say, some flexibility in terms of the use, uh, especially when you have some ambiguity in, in, in the design. Um, in computation, this ambiguity is something difficult to deal with because the ambiguity plays an important role in the definition of the architecture. There's also another thing. Uh, the idea that every uh, room needs to be associated with a specific function, uh, on one hand, is, is important because that's the only way you can define the adjacency graph and the adjacency matrix. Otherwise, you cannot. Um, but on the other hand, it would be interesting to have spaces that can be next to any space. Yes. Okay. And, uh, and we usually uh, work with that or have the flexibility even to draw plans where almost every space has this characteristic. We have a particular uh, type of building in, in, in Lisbon where no space except one particular <coughs> space, which is infrastructure, uh, has a particular function. And we find that with Uh, where, in principle, abstractly, you have uh, spaces which are connected to all the other spaces around, and you don't have a specific function. Any, anybody can use those spaces in there mm. uh, as they please. Uh, the only one which has a, a, a specific function is the one that contains uh, the infrastructure space, which is the kitchen, and the other. Other spaces are abstract spaces. Um, then there is a specialization of the space, which is also related to the way that the space relates with the outside uh, of the building. It, it faces the main street, it faces the, uh, the main courtyard, if it faces south, if it faces north, east, west, everything uh, plays a role in there. Another assumption is that uh, you can put the entrance anywhere. 
Yes. Which is uh, also not uh, the, um, the real situation in most design. Even when you have uh, um, an urban plot where you can place the house in any place, you have a, a, a let's say, a, a preference for an entrance uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, in the plot because there is a relation with the street. With That means that that is the best position for the entrance of the plot, and then that defines also the best position for the entrance uh, of the house. And again, if you have a house in a, um, in a collective housing uh, building, uh, you have a vertical access uh, uh, which defines the distribution to the several apartments, and then you have a Leaders position at the entrance. You may not have that much flexibility uh, regarding where you enter the, uh, the house. So uh, this means that um, the most difficult thing, um, and I also say that from personal experience, is to, uh, while also automating any kind of uh, design uh, system, is to deal with the assumptions. In principle, we should define very well the assumptions. Uh, they should be extremely true in a way, very consistent, but uh, at a certain point, you find out that there is always another way to address the problem and that the assumptions are creating these difficulties. Yes. Um, so the, the, this is something that we uh, should discuss a lot. And I believe that many of these uh, things um, can be solved with in interactivity. You know, like simply um, constraining parts in the design uh, or being able to react to some design freeze something and redesign again. Interactivity makes it possible for us to deal even with changes in the assumption because uh, one thing that happens during the design process is that you change uh, your ideas about what you believe is true or not. So if you start thinking about the design system in an abstract, you will deal with a lot of things uh, uh, as being most important ones to take in consideration. But when you start a particular design, uh, you immediately say that that's not important at all. That is in, in this case, there is this, in that case, there is another thing. And there's always something more important than the assumptions that you have in principle. Uh, so I would say that the difficulties are these ones. Um, and, and that's something we should discuss a lot doesn't mean that uh, the work was not interesting, it was very interesting. I'm just saying that it, it is a very difficult problem, and the reasons why the problem is very difficult are basically principles. Should be. Okay. And, and that's, uh, if we can, let's say, uh, be one step forward uh, regarding how to deal with these issues and make it really more powerful and, and useful for architects um, using this kind of uh, generic tools. Um, that's a great <coughs> idea. So it, that's something I'm sure we're going to discuss a lot. Sure. Any, any more things? Well, uh, uh, you know the, the, the work of the Papalango scheme. No. No. Uh, it's, a, it's a Greek and uh, he, he works in the United States. We have a, a very good, interesting uh, work related with, with this. And uh, I think uh, your work 
is um, in the first stage. Yes. And, uh, and I think it's uh, only um, a, ge a geometric treatment. Yes. And uh, we need a typologic treatment because some of the, the problems Bernoulli uh, spoke about that. But uh, I think. Uh, the, the, the typologic um, problem is more difficult than the geometric problem. And uh, we work in the geometric uh, solution, the geometric solution, or a lot of geometric solutions. But uh, the I think the, the, the typologic uh, solution uh, works together with the geometric uh, solution and we uh, result in a good solution. And I think you, you need this, this, uh, this approach, the, the typological approach. And uh, I, I recommend you to, to to, to see the work of uh, Papalandis. I okay. have, I have here yeah, some, some reference of, of that. If you, if you want. I have a lot of reference. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Those good? I think yeah, there are a lot of options. Okay. Yeah, I'm reading it. So I read first two chapters. Uh, one of the one of the ways to deal with this kind of problem is, is to actually work not with a, a bunch of um, isolated shapes, even if you associate them with uh, the unit of the function. But better than that, <coughs> uh, to work uh, with the language, uh, with, with the language, which is the, the way that the approach the, the problem. Oh. It's, um, it's a little bit different from uh, the one that uh, the, the proposal that you define because you propose an additional ad addition process. Okay, so. Yeah. 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 It's the principles of optimal design model adaptation. Principles of optimal design. Optimal design adaptation. With the shape premise. Design language. Define. We are just moving to slide. Then the shape premise. This is a, a master science thesis of uh, Nikolek. He's a member of the Papalambus team. It's very interesting this this uh, master science thesis, interactive layout design optimization and interactive optimization tool for architecture of floor plan layout design. Four architecture. 
show the photo. And for starting, you can see this this pack, huh? this uh, all team, Nicolek, uh, Papalandos, Sodri. This one, I think I have shared it. I think it. Are you acquainted with the shape and theory? I have just read Stini when I started working. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. It's uh, volume 34, number five. This, uh, this paper. This one. No, no, the, the, the architecture layout the design of him. Yes, I have written it. 34, five. Yes. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a good work. Okay. Uh, we like it, this, this project. And we joined the, the both approach, the geometrical approach and the topological approach. Okay. And I think uh, we need to. Uh, yeah, the, the reason why I was uh, talking about language, design language, uh, the shape grammar is capable of defining uh, um, or um, defining the rules uh, embedded within a design style. Um, it, it means that we can generate uh, designs uh, that uh, somehow belong to a particular design language. There are advantages in that and, and disadvantages. If you work with a particular design language, you know that the only designs that you can obtain are within the language. You cannot do something outside the language. In the case of Jose Barclay, he did de develop Shape grammar to describe uh, the, the language of design, uh, the housing system design by Caesar. The fact is that grammar only designs uh, those, kind of, those kind of houses. And you only have uh, um, Malagaya houses designed in that way. Um, of course, any architect will want to design their own houses rather than Caesar's houses. Uh, that means that the rules embedded in the, the shape wrapper should be generic enough for uh, any architect to be able to uh, uh, express himself with the, with the grammar. Um, to make it generic is always a problem because uh, the tendency of the grammar, of the uh, shape wrapper, is to become very specific, especially when it has a lot of. Uh, detailed uh, rules about what to generate and how to generate. Um, but um, as a system for designing, it, it, it makes some sense. I'm going to make some kind of a shift in, in, in the design process where you design first the grammar okay. and this is part of the design process I'm going to make it linear now but I, I think the process should not be linear okay. then you design many solutions using the grammar, 
and then you find some uh, optimization process to select it. Okay, so there is a selection process. Uh, to do this part is easy because if you have the grammar, the grammar is capable of designing many solutions. If you have those millions, it's always better. But you have these millions corresponding to a design style, let's say, because the grammar contains that. If the grammar is well done, problems of composition, problems of, uh, um, uh, of aesthetical relation and proportion, can be embedded in the grammar. Uh, the selection process is always related with the assumptions. Okay, so assumptions here play play a role, and they can make uh, uh, good or bad outcomes. So I would say that this is a problem, and this is a problem. This is basic, basically the automated part. It's not a big deal. The most important thing is that this part is not independent of this. Because when we get a final solution, or when we get several solutions, we get some visual um, um, stimulation about what we're doing. It's not just a question of, um, you know, um, uh, fitting all the requirements, okay? Uh, we, uh, we create requirements as we go. That's part of the typical architectural creative process. And that's the difficult, difficult thing about computation. Because in computation, we need to uh, define the requirements in the beginning, okay? And then you define some rules to, uh, 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 to compute the problem. You know which the requirements requirements are, uh, sometimes you may have some complex uh, uh, um, uh, contradicting requirements, which means that we need to go through some optimization process uh, to get what we may call the best solution or, or a not optimal solution out of, out of that. But still, uh, we start from predefined requirements. And the thing is, we define the requirements as we go, especially the aesthetical ones. And the aesthetical ones are, um, um, they, they are a reaction, a continuous reaction from the creator uh, uh, on what we see, okay? Um, and that, that's the reason why I think what is important in, in this part is that this part is what makes the possibility of bringing interactivity into all this. So this is a difficult part, this is a difficult part. What's difficult here is to make it not automatic, but interactive. Uh, and the interactivity here um, is all, always changing the assumption. Assumptions should, should be uh, thought as a, a, a changing uh, thing, which usually is not. It's, it's considered a requirement, and uh, we're going to fix this, and it's, it is because we fix this that we can solve all the rest. And the design problem, it's especially when we talk about what we call, usually, is usually called wicked problems, okay? They are wicked because the assumptions are always changing. Those are varieties. Okay. And how can we deal with that? That's very difficult. But uh, it is my uh, uh, viewpoint that if we have a way of fine tuning this while generating some solutions and reacting on the selection process, so changing the assumptions, playing with the assumptions as variables, okay, so we change this, go again here, and if we go around this loop, okay,
Okay? And we're talking also about an optimization process. So there might be a loop inside this loop. Okay? But it means that there is a feedback that fine tunes the grammar, the creative process is very fine. Um, and in the end, we get one solution because when we have one design problem, we want one solution. In certain cases, for instance, a large uh, housing development, we may want to have uh, diverse solutions for the same generic problem. So that, for instance, in a thousand houses, we don't have all, all the houses with the same design. But we will probably want to have different design within the same language, in the sense that we want some coherence uh, uh, in the whole. Um, so again, it, it makes it more useful to have a system like this every time we want to generate similar in one sense, but different solutions. Um, so that means I usually say that in those cases, we are designing the system rather than a single solution. And every time you have a design problem that is better answered with the system rather than a single solution, <coughs> then the generic approach becomes out of power. But we also have this problem. Okay. So maybe after talking so, so much, it would be interesting that everybody would comment on this and, and, and perhaps suggest something or something to add to, to this or an alternative or anything like that. No, no, obviously, if we add more architectural things, then it will restrict the number of solutions. Yeah. And yeah, that's the purpose that it, it would be more friendly because, like, what I'm doing is developing a tool to help architects. I, I can't become an architect, and I am no. not. But yeah, it's like, yeah, these kind of the tools, if we add, yeah, it will restrict the solution. Like we want this room on the north side and this one on the south side and something like that and yeah so yes yeah we can add like you know these type of the options somewhere which are quite interesting for us
I guess it's more important to, to look at uh, those kinds of problems and or, or at least how you imagine that you keep uh, on the middle part, that first three thousand years ago. But you should maybe consider how does that link, link to the uh, previous module or the further module in the first place. <coughs> or maybe something else. Uh, the thing is that um, sometimes because I'm, I'm doing something similar, which is a tool for helping uh, designers and users designing tableware elements. So to, to, to design business sets sets and <coughs> it's easy to uh, try and at least for me to get a little obsessed with trying to do everything in depth so it will be able to design the perfect business set for everybody in the world but uh, I, I know I, uh, there are several aspects that I will not be able to, cover, to be able to cover for example optimization of uh, the material that is going to be put into the pieces or ergonomics or stuff like that. But uh, in the meantime, what I think is maybe it's more important to cover things like what the, are the best way, what are the main things that designers want, for example, or computers want. And, um, and sometimes these things are outside of the tool itself. Sometimes it's the interface, the interface is actually also very important. The way um, the users, in this case, are supposed to use it or not. I think that I, I was looking here at your presentation that I usually show to my students on the third year, the students of the design studio team of the third year of this house. And it starts from the, the design of a, uh, of a house type and it ends up with the collective housing buildings with some pop-ups that we show program. Um, and the issue of uh, composition is one of the most difficult ones. Uh, composition, but always taking into account that behind this composition there is structure logic and there's also infrastructure which also has logic and um, all these con somehow constrains how we can design the building um, and it's a lot more important than just thinking about the correct angle of architects in each other. Actually I would say that the reduction of the problem to just rectangular adjacency is a, is a big one in the sense that these are not the most important problems in developing a, a, a housing uh, complex or in fact any kind of architectural problem because this would be applied to other kinds of architectural problems like a hospital where the complexity is very big and this would be very easy. Uh, anyway, uh, so the composition pro problem is always a problem either if it's hospital or just a, a, a housing program. Um, there are many people who work on this uh, compositional issue. But one of the things I would like to show you is actually the, um, the, uh, the lecture that I did to the students because it brings uh, ways of using uh, what I would call composition matrices. Then at a certain point, what you have is that your rectangles need to be a certain composition structure. And that would bring something into the problem which would be more interesting. And the flexibility or the interactivity could be like changing parameters of the uh, composition matrix. Okay? If you have something working like this, you have 
completely automated system in terms of positioning the rectangles, rectangles which I would interpret the rectangles as um, uh, functional areas which may or may not have water. Okay? Um, and, um, and then this adjacency that uh, should if this adjacency in the, uh, uh, is placed on uh, uh, a matrix which contains all these requirements about composition, structure, and even structure of the building, then you know that the results that you get in the end have some order behind it, order that contains structural issues, constructive issues, and infrastructure already in the problem. So for instance, one typical decision uh, um, in, while designing uh, a flat housing building is where do I place all the uh, classrooms and kitchen because I want to have all the waters and all the water pipes close to each other. Reference would be on the same wall. It's practically the less amount of material. Yeah. But it's relative to what's in the kitchen. Yeah. So this is a very important decision when you design projects. And even when you think, well, I, I could have um, different houses at every level of the building, that's true, but the tendency would be to have all the water based. Compartments on the same uh, area, on the same vertical uh, alignment. Even though you may have some of the walls of these uh, uh, classrooms in a different position, but there would, would be definitely one wall in common for all the uh, classrooms that come from the top of the building to the base of the building. Um, and this is a very important composition of the building. So maybe we should talk about what are the things that you need to place at a certain point, which are variables, but all the other calculations are done around something that you fix at a certain point. So meaning that there are decisions that you need to take progressively. Uh, you fix some decisions and then you generate others like this. And if you can change the decisions that you made at the beginning and then regenerate according to whatever codes were made in, in that program, then maybe we can build somewhere which architects might be useful. And I, they should be the, the, the um, there was a there should be visibility for them to overlap or for yeah. some areas they can uh, have. You, actually, when I started uh, like my PhD, so my work was not at all like about designing, not at all like. I did it at like very end. So first what we are thinking is to generate the covariance. Like we generate one thing moment of inertia. So we found that it can give like a relative heaviness of a building. So how we place the room so that the building, the overall weight should not be at the particular point, but it should be distributed. I think that can be a good tool for the architect that okay, how to design and something like that. So yeah, so initially we worked mainly on the covariance, but I don't know, somehow I switched to this design thing. So it's just like five, ten percent of my work. But yeah, now I'm more interested in design. So, so you're wondering the future of their part of analysis. This can really apply this analysis to what we have. Like, for example, if you have a sufficient amount of material conditions, you yes. can use this perfectly. And if, if you can do so often, you can do 
There is a diagram which explains the design process. I, I think it's very funny. I'm going to draw it there. Uh, it talks about design being a negotiation between, uh, this was defined by Brian Watson, uh, it brings up a triangle in space. And on one side of the triangle, you have the problem definition. And of course, you want to get the solution on the other side of the triangle. And it says that uh, design is a negotiation between problem and solution, using as methods analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. Interesting thing is that you can see this uh, diagram in any position. So any way you address this problem, you can take. And it means that you can start with the with the solution, define the problem, things like that. Uh, you, and you usually, when you try to start more close to the solution, you simply place something that is your first attempt. I'm going to try this, and then you analyze it, evaluate it, get back to the problem, refine the problem, do something, evaluate again, and it's always that that that, that way. There is an author who calls the, this idea of starting with something. And with, uh, with some design, uh, she calls it the <coughs> primary generator. Something that you simply put forward as an idea. But if we gain the view of horizon 2020, why would we respond to this view? That can be a part of the research. It's actually a difficult part. I have uh, some, uh, some doubts about uh, the way you approach this um, and the way you section the, the spaces in a very strict manner. Uh, for instance, in this plus shape, you subdivide it into five spaces instead of, for instance, uh, one very large rectangle and two opposites, or just, uh, I don't know, any other thing you did with the running one to do with it. Uh, why did you chose to go that way? You, I think initially, like I told you, one idea was the Pogrin, but the other idea is to like, there's the one officer of architect Pierre Pellegrino in Geneva. So he told me that this is like very hard problem for us, automation. And he didn't, because I didn't know anything about architecture. So he just gave me this problem that it is like we don't know we are working from last five ten years and this is the problem and i'm giving you some constraints like the what we talk about number of trips and if you manage to automate and then we proceed further so initially like i was very blind in like you know moving just trying to solve the problem mathematically i didn't know that why it is useful how it would be more useful and all that and the time i managed to provide this solution my PhD is over. So I think after getting this solution, they want to move forward that how they can use it. Because they know better that because they were they had the problem, but they didn't have the solution. So I gave the solution, which is like at the very initial stage, but they liked it. And then we wanted to move further. So that's why it is like, you know, very restricted that we are, but it is not difficult to make some kind of these changes, like what you are saying, considering this big rectangle and then some smaller, that would not be so difficult because now we have the idea that how to do it. 
So we can define this like we can choose the partition how we want the partition or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Here just about the automation. That's it. <laughs> Why? Yeah. But, uh, I, I think that one of the most interesting things about the official tools that are being developed is the dishonesty of the little bit of the debate that we are going on. Is this uh, interoperability between the computational part and the designer, in which the computer provides a solution that is really worth respecting. But I immediately want to get there and change one of the rooms position and rearrange it. And maybe that would be an input for a, a new generation. And uh, it would be a mixed uh, process between the, the automatic computation and the designer's point of view. And I don't know if this is something that uh, is uh, actually feasible, but uh, I think this might be a very interesting way to go. Because of course the computer probably basically tells us what to, what we tell it, what we ask from it. And as you said, the minimal uh, outer space, uh, extra space area. However, that's really minimal and it provides the solution. But is that exactly the, the solution that we want? Is that the optimal solution for our problem? Or do we need to go and uh, evaluate at least the 20 least area, or maybe the 50? Uh, I don't say for a million because that's very much possible. Uh, but uh, uh, the way you put for the uh, problem, the design problem, shapes the solution at the end. That's the reason why the design. In the design process, we need to be able to change the problem in the end as well. And uh, the best example I know, uh, if you want, uh, I'm, I'm going to refer to a thesis which was developed by one of my colleagues at, at, at Google. And he gave an, an example which I always thought was a big failure. Uh, he developed uh, Generic algorithm to, to, to solve some optimization problem. He improved the genetic algorithm by using fuzzy logic in, 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 in the algorithm. But um, he worked with a, 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 with a design problem that he defined like this so I have an urban block, it's divided into, into several, several blocks. And I want to place a house uh, in this block. And I want to place it in the best place so that I optimize the garden to have the biggest possible garden. And simultaneously, the most private, the best privacy in the garden. Privacy in the terms of not being uh, um, seen by other people living in the, in the houses around. Uh, he showed me the software working, and, and, and there was these cubes which were the houses, and and the cubes were moving around, and then suddenly they freeze in a particular place. And he said, "Well, this is the optimal solution." And I looked at it, and I thought, "This is a terrible design. What's the problem?" And and again, I asked, "What are you looking for? What what do you need to optimize?" Best garden at the most private. Well, why not doing a L-shaped house like this with a private garden and uh, uh, and houses uh, uh, L-shaped? Yeah, you have uh, the best possible garden in terms of, uh, of uh, land use, and also it's a hundred percent private. Nobody is looking into your garden. Um, so I could give not an optimal solution, a perfect solution to this, to this problem. Okay. And uh, that means that something was wrong with that problem, the, the way he was uh, defining the problem, and the assumptions that he was creating. The first assumption that was wrong is that to, to define the problem, to solve the problem, the houses have to be cubes. Why? Then you can also solve the problem of privacy by placing the window in a particular part of the, uh, of the construction.
construction. So the, the wind goes down frequently, uh, the rain will start. <coughs> um, so there are a lot of ways of solving the problem. And the way you put forward the problem, a lot of assumptions. So basically, these assumptions were well, the, 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 the building, uh, you don't know where the, the windows are, can be anywhere. You don't know that the shape of the building is a, uh, is a cube, uh, has to be a cube for some reason. And it's, it's not an architectural problem. No architectural problem is like that. One more thing which we thought like when we were working, especially with my professor, is that like obviously we are not architects, we can't think like that. But sometimes computer can produce something which you haven't thought of. Yeah. So it is producing so many designs, and obviously you have the option like ah, this is something new, this position, and then obviously it is very easy, like you can draw this on the paper and then you can make the changes. Like, no, I want this, like this part to be here and this and this. But initially it is producing some ideas which you may have never thought of and something new and something like that. And then, so it's like the very initial design that giving you this many ideas and then yeah, you can proceed further with by making the so many changes as you want. Let's, let me ask you a difficult question. Among the four million solutions, how many are absolutely silly and how many are, let's say, very logic? Uh, yeah, so that's that's you have to decide. Like, but like we can restrict to, I'm not going for four million solutions, let's say 10 solutions. But yeah, sometimes like someone is like, you know, placing some extra space at some other position, someone is changing the room and well, it's like the, very small number of the rooms but let's say that if like 1000 rooms and then if something is giving solution then yeah it, it is good to start like okay at least we have some some solutions that about the positions of these 1000 rooms and now from this basic thing we can start in in the Jose Blanc's uh, thesis uh, one of the things that he does is uh, uh, because it's also producing millions of solutions so um, he, he faced the same problem. Um, the way that the human mind works is basically by filtering a lot of stuff. You don't want to deal with millions. You want to deal with particular problems yes. and starting from simple, simple problems and then detailing the problem progressively. And somehow uh, in the rule application, he wanted to do something similar to that, and he used uh, uh, some heuristic decisions to guide the, the, the generation of designs. And these heuristics are things like um, uh, what preference do you have in, in terms of uh, these kind of rooms? Do you want them to be bigger than these ones? What are your preferences? So the, even though you could have situations where you would have other types of solutions, you would filter immediately the ones that have to fit your preferences. And this is this is one of the possible approaches. Like filtering uh, from all possibilities the ones that where your preferences don't fit. Okay. So it, it, it's basically creating additional constraints or additional rules uh, which are related with uh, Call them heuristic guidance or something like that. In one sense, um, so that's that's uh, a possible uh, approach. But still, we have the problem to deal with many, many solutions. We want either to get to a small set and then to deal with a small set, uh, or uh, or simply go step by step and make decisions. Step by step. And uh, that's our um, thinking process. Of course, we don't have the computational, the calculational capacity or the computer to calculate the, uh, many solutions. So that's the reason why we, uh, we work, our brain works that way. But um, I 
think there's also something very good in that. And one of the interesting ways that we work is that we create a kind of memory of good practices. And that guides our decisions. And it would be interesting to think how we can replicate that memory of good practices in, in a system like this. Okay. Um, Database which you can bear with you, but it has some kind of flexibility. Another thing is that what we keep in our mind is not a sharp memory of something, it's a flexible image of something. We don't bring the reference exactly as it was originally, we adapt it to our situation. It means that. That particular piece of information uh, is not a sharp one, it's a flexible piece of information. But still in the way we present in the way we process. And the closest thing to that uh, that I heard of was uh, a work developed by uh, Alex uh, Lennon. He works, uh, he's a researcher from uh, ETH Zurich, but he also works at uh, Northeast uh, School. Of, uh, he works actually with a Dutch guy. I, I can look for that. Uh, anyway, he developed uh, one design for a very complex building which had different. Uh, Different floor shapes, and he wanted to test very fast how to uh, put a lot of, uh, um, uh, of different uh, housing types in, in, in those different uh, floor shapes. So he developed first a database uh, with a lot of uh, floor plans uh, from nice apartments, nice houses, so what he called good practices, he picked up from the best architects. And then he find parametric models of these uh, um, uh, uh, of these plans, so that could be formal looking. And then the calculation process, what we think was doing, it was basically feeding those plans inside the original shape and uh, stretching the plans a little bit so that they could adapt parametrically to the space, uh, but the, he was always applying plans that, he, uh, that were already considered good. Okay. Of course the result got silly things that couldn't be built, like uh, uh, a structure of one uh, apartment that wouldn't fit with the structure of the other below. It, it wouldn't be possible that way. But in terms of op op optimizing very uh, well uh, defined plans, the, the, the result in the end was at least per floor, uh, uh, it was a very consistent one in the sense that all the apartments were very logical, were good apartments, very well shaped because they were taken from the best architects. And even though that looked a little bit like a patchwork, there was some ordering order came from the original designs. Um, it was a strange approach, but very curious, curious in this sense, because he was using the, the best practices of other architects and simply applying everything together in the two plans. And it was reasonably flexible, so it had that, that thing that we can have with our uh, uh, brain, you know, picking up a reference but distorting the reference a little bit. To adapt to our situation. Uh, everything was there on a computational basis. Uh, it was not perfect. It still had a lot of problems to solve. There was something there. Yeah. Okay, that's it. <laughs> okay. Um, I think um, we 
should plan, as I suggested, I, I think we should plan another session where we should work in the reverse way. Okay? <coughs> so basically, we bring some problems uh, that may have um, an important mathematical discussion uh, to, to, to bring forward. And, and, and then we would like to have your feedback Exhibition, uh, the photography exhibition, and all the videos that they allow to use with uh, the related stuff. And I will probably be involved in that. Okay, but we can have the meeting on the board. Uh, it's just uh, it's just a show video. You're yeah. just for that week, so Professor Black will ask you to show it. I think we'll do it before we have this lecture. But uh, yes. And uh, just we have already warned you that uh, we will be asking you many things from you. Um, just one question uh, Who never saw the, the, my presentation on uh, John Hallerman's work? I did. I saw it. Okay. Uh, because maybe I could show it, it would be important. Regarding that issue of having a, a, a compositional structure behind the generation of solution. Uh, so maybe I could show it. Uh, as, yeah, I can, I can do it. I can show it as fast as possible. It, it's something that I have prepared for a long time. It's working. Yeah, I, I created the, the, the other guy. Yeah, he's not logged up here. Then the, the kick it, kick it. Then. I don't see it.
Why, when you want to do something, you want to watch me? Huh? I'm watching you. Yeah, I nice. Nice, nice. If you stop, you know, create another one when you create the, 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 the thing and it doesn't move, it's not good at all. Because it's, I don't want to, it's supposed to. It's not asking me to, to enjoy this conversation. Can you please uh, log out that thing? You. How to log out that thing? Yeah, I have no idea. Because maybe I will press the maybe second computer. I have to. Is not uh, requesting the connection. I can film you from there. It's fine. It's fine. Because uh, I don't know. It was, it was working fine with him, but not with him. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I usually show this presentation. The presentation is written in Portuguese and Spanish, I think. Uh, because case. the original book is in At least it's Spanish. Out. I mean, the tra is a Spanish translation. Um, anyway, um, John Abrakan was, um, he's is still alive and still working. Uh, He's a Dutch uh, architect that uh, wrote a very important book uh, in the beginning of the 60s. It was published in 61, called Supports, uh, an Alternative to Mass Housing. And this was basically a reaction to the housing construction that was being done in, um, in Europe 
in Europe in the post-war um, period because it was uh, basically uh, uh, construction based on repetition. It, it, it was repeating the same, uh, uh, the same model over and over and uh, cities were being criticized to be um, uh, to be uh, monotonous and not interesting and he decided that he wanted to develop ways that would be compatible with mass production but could be able to uh, design uh, um, unique houses for the needs of particular families so basically a way of customizing every house in uh, uh, in a building um, so he developed this idea of separating what he called the support from what he called the infill package which was the personal uh, approach to the house and in that book the only drawing draw uh, drawing that he showed was this one basically you have the support which is a structural system and an infrastructural system that contains these uh, customizable elements, which were the infill packages. Um, the problem was to design that. So then he devoted uh, several years to study how to design supports. And in 74, so 14 years later, he comes out with uh, uh, a book called The Design of Supports that was at a certain point in, at the beginning of the 80s published in Spain and influenced a lot the Spanish architects. And, and somehow it, some of these ideas became a practice in uh, Spanish architecture and uh, Dutch architecture also. Um, anyway, um, one of uh, his approaches was never to design a building himself. He wanted to spread out the word as a concept and, and not uh, as a designer. So he wanted people to look at his concepts, criticize him eventually for, for the ideas, but never for a particular design. So he didn't want to be criticized by his architecture. It's very curious because the only building he designed was his, uh, his private house and before he published uh, uh, supports. So the first uh, book in, in, in the 60s. Uh, anyway, he approaches the problem in this way. First of all, it considers that uh, uh, the support can be something with any extension which is divided in several zones. And it defines different types of zones. The alpha zone, which is an area, an internal area, um, which is um, designed for private use. And it has uh, an adjacency to an exterior wall, okay? And then the uh, beta uh, area, zone uh, which is an area internal area uh, designed for private use and is not adjacent to a, um, to a, an exterior wall, wall so this would be a beta zone and this would be an alpha zone and the margins would be the places in between something that could overlap so this would be an alpha beta margin and here the same then he also defines two other um, types of zones the delta zone which is an external area uh, which is uh, designed for private use it can be a balcony okay uh, or uh, yeah private balcony or veranda and um, a gamma uh, uh, zone which can be interior or exterior but it's uh, designed for public use so let's say uh, an 
access uh, um, gallery, uh, something like that. You know, all the accessibility to the building is typically this kind of uh, uh, this kind of zone. And again, you have the margins in between uh, the alpha delta margin here, alpha gamma margin. So this would be the typical structure of uh, a support building containing on one side the gallery for accessing all the apartments and the other part would have private balconies. Then he also defines uh, different types uh, of spaces. He has, he calls them uh, spaces for special use, uh, spaces for generic use, and spaces for, uh, for services. So typically the services you have uh, uh, these extremely functional areas with basically the, 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 uh, the toilets. Um, for special uses you have bedrooms and kitchen. They have, let's say, a very uh, well-defined program. And those ones which can have an ambiguous use uh, are uh, um, uh, spaces for general uh, generic use. And the interesting thing is that he says that uh, the spaces for special uses should have a connection with an exterior wall and spaces for generic use they, can, they should have a connection with at least one exterior wall, but they can overlap uh, 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 zones and, and go from one side to the other, while the special uh, uses uh, always occupy uh, one zone <coughs> and the margin, but they never all overlap zones. So as an example, you have these positions, position one, which is a space that uh, overlaps uh, a zone and ends in a margin. Uh, position two, space that uh, overlaps more than one zone. And position three, space that uh, uh, um, starts and ends in the same margin, which is something like this, okay? Could be any inner corridor or something like that. Then it starts defining uses and how these uses can fit the spaces. Okay, so it defines uh, uh, generic uses and correlates the generic uses with the spaces. And then it populates those uses with particular uh, um, uh, pieces of furniture which give a specific use to, uh, to the space. So this is the generic approach where you have living room, kitchen, bedroom, but then when you populate the space with, uh, 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 with, the, with all the, 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 the furniture, then it becomes something specific. So let's say that uh, uh, this notation corresponds to a generic type while the other is an instance of that type. Uh, then he defines the idea of a sector and the sector uh, uh, um, um, is, um, uh, is a zone with a particular occupation. So these are sectors, okay? And group sectors, they can become a, a, a generic uh, house type, okay? In the sense that the, the, the house, the work, uh, the way the, the house works is composed of several sectors uh, with several uses. So you can define groups of sectors just by stating uh, how the functions relate to each other. We, diagrams like this, okay? I, put, I can give you the presentation at the end so that you can check it. Um, so uh, uh, 
we call uh, um, um, a basic uh, variety to a particular group of sectors, a particular organization of a group of sectors is a, a, a basic variant and a sub variant is the, the particular instance, a particular instance of that, uh, um, of that basic variant. So these are two possible instances, the two sub variants of this basic variant. And then he shows uh, some possibilities of the, for designing um, supports. And he gives uh, the typical uh, um, left, right, right uh, uh, housing typology with uh, 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 where the, the, um, the uh, gamma uh, um, zone corresponds to the, to the staircase. And then you have the occupation uh, of these spaces. And he shows possible occupations of those spaces and different levels of control. Study of, uh, uh, of basic variants, how they can be organized. Then particular sub variants, so instances of those variants. And these are all possibilities for populating the building, let's say. <coughs> then he had a problem, uh, which was a metrical problem to solve, uh, because he, he also wanted to, uh, to solve a basic uh, thing, was to fit all these concepts to mass production re requirements. And, uh, and so the, the metrical problem could be defined as this. Uh, basically, there was a, a kind of two way of measuring things. Uh, the engineer which measures things taking in consideration the structure. And typically, the support is defined by defining the measures of the structure. But the architect uh, uh, basically measured uh, the, the, the the size of spaces and the requirements uh, towards the size of spaces is the most important issue. So they actually take this measure from inside instead of using the uh, uh, construction axis of, uh, uh, of the building. So to solve this, uh, it came forward with an idea which he called the Tartan um, grid which is a grid which corresponds to the overlap of two grids uh, with uh, a particular uh, uh, type uh, of measures, which were based on um, the, um, um, the international standards, which use the module um, of six centimeters. If you look into the... Uh, the um, the German norms, they are all based on uh, six, 60 centimeters, and you have subdivisions of this or uh, uh, multiples of this. And he basically took 30 centimeters and then subdivided in, in pieces of 10, so 20 and 10. And the overlap uh, is defined in this way, so you have five centimeters uh, uh, for uh, difference from this, uh, the, the structure comparing with this, um, with the, the tartan grid that it's overlapped below. Using this, he could place measures in different ways in the grid. So you could get the physical elements placed like this, and you knew that in the end, you would always have standard measures for all the, the construction elements. That would allow the possibility of mass production following uh, um, these standard measures. He also talks about uh, um, the concept uh, of tolerance, 
which means that uh, the system also can contain uh, a way of dealing with the tolerance of materials. And he defines all, all these details. I'm not going very much in detail with, with this. And tolerance regarding the vertical uh, plan, uh, the tolerance was placed above, fixing uh, uh, the, the, the ground level. Let's say that every floor has a fixed level. And, and then if there's some tolerance in the construction elements, you, have, you consider the toler tolerance in the ceiling. Uh, it shows some, uh, um, some examples of, uh, 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 of buildings using these ideas. And they defined these supports. He had the method to study all the zones, uh, uh, all the, the um, basic variants, uh, analyze possibilities of occupation in the sectors, and basically studying all the combinatorial uh, aspects of, uh, um, uh, of the support. And in the end, he illustrates uh, 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 the support by showing subvariants and how they fit together. This is another one, another support with a different structure. And it is basically showing different types of supports in a very abstract way, just to show that uh, we, with this theory, it is in, in principle possible to design almost every kind of, uh, uh, of housing, uh, um, of collective housing uh, uh, type. Uh, without um, without imposing a style, so there is still a lot of uh, freedom for the architect to design uh, uh, the building in a particular style, uh, even if he or she follows uh, follows this uh, um, uh, this method. So again, different studies of occupation of. Uh, um, of basic variants, sub-variants, and then you get even a model with these solutions. Okay. Another one, just to show that you can apply the same theory to different house types. In this case, these are basic row houses, but still you can see that uh, we can talk about similar design language, uh, uh, but they're all different. And again, different models. Another one can become quite complex. And then he tried to develop ways of applying this idea of working with zones also in, in urbanism, and some work was, uh, was done uh, on, on, on this subject. Uh, usually the main problem was a technological one regarding infrastructure, and I can show an image, um, which is this one that shows the complexity of uh, uh, of infrastructure in, in, in the building. But again, he was proposing that uh, if you can see that the tartan grid, it's, it's very, uh, very fuzzy, but it's behind all this. So all the design was done using the tartan grid. So everything it fits into a modular system, okay? Everything works with standard me measures. Now, the interesting thing is to see how this was interpreted by the Spanish at a certain point. And they bring a little few more concepts into, uh, into this idea of um, designing based on uh, compositional issues organized along uh, zones. The idea of zones is it organizes not just the distribution of spaces, it organizes 
structure it organizes the composition of the building okay and um, and they show several examples and one of the things that the Spanish uh, brought to the theory was that uh, it's not just a question of designing zones but there's also another uh, important issue which is to design what they called uh, uh, nodes nodes or uh, hard um, nuclear elements which correspond to the vertical elements that need to align vertically basically the infrastructure it means that for this composition you can have things like this which are vertically aligned in the building and then you have your uh, uh, zones and then you compose things along these zones you keep up this uh, uh, element and it's basically an idea for or a set of concepts to uh, keep some order in the design so these are compositional issues but simultaneously you know that structure can contain all these elements and also be aligned in these elements so somehow, uh, not just this, but even this, okay? So this idea of working with, uh, 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 with these compositional uh, uh, ideas was uh, very important um, at a certain point. And there is a publication on housing called Housing, um, done by a Spanish architect, uh, um, Manuel Galza, and he's basically doing a, a, a very big comp compilation of solutions. And in most solutions, we can find this concept of, have, of having the um, uh, compositional structure of housing projects based on zones. Stripes, organizational stripes in these uh, buildings. Another solution with the same idea. In this case, the, the infrastructure uh, areas are contained in this zone, so they can align vertically. So other examples, this one for instance, and again, the infrastructure areas are always uh, aligned vertically. The same here, the idea of, uh, of the node or hard nucleus is very clear, which basically corresponds to the, uh, to the water zones, so the, the, the toilets. Here a similar thing, here in detail, so we have all the toilets aligned in the same zone. All this furniture aligned in the same zone. The compositional structure is perfectly clear. It's even in terms of typology uh, uh, very unusual because the, the beds are actually underneath the corridor. We have the corridor here and the bed slides uh, uh, below the corridor, it's a very unusual uh, solution. Uh, another very unusual solution where the spaces are divided by furniture. Okay, so this is the placement of furniture which actually defines how spaces appear. We have table, kitchen on one side, uh, kind of a ambiguous uh, room on the other side, can be a living room, can be something in between dining and, and living room. Uh, then we have a, a bedroom here. Other solutions where the node and this is the placement of the node that actually defines the specialization of spaces. 
So we can immediately imagine that here we have the dining room, uh, here we have the living room, we go up and upstairs we have uh, the bedrooms on one side and everything is based on placing the, the, the node, the, the infrastructure node in a particular place. And then we get designs out of this, same concept. Another similar concept. This is a very complex um, project from uh, some Dutch architects where this idea of, uh, of support is perfectly clear. We have a support which can have any kind of uh, apartment inside, even any kind of use. It's not just an apartment building. It has offices, it has a lot of functions. It's a multifunctional uh, building, but the concept of uh, support is perfectly clear here. And then it has very different systems of occupation. And of course, the, the language of the building is a big mess, but uh, it's part of the idea to make it uh, as messy as possible. But you see that the infrastructure, the elements, and the vertical elements are always aligned in the same place. So that the, the support is very clearly defined at the beginning. More complex uh, idea where the conceptually the building, the, 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 the houses uh, fit like a 3D Tetris uh, uh, space. And you have apartments like this, you have an apartment like this, uh, another apartment. So every apartment has its particular shape and they all fit spatially. Another thing where you can see very clearly from the urban structure, uh, you can see very cl clearly that you have uh, a composition mat matrix, okay? And then everything fits into the composition matrix. Another similar approach where even though you have the same matrix, you can have different apartments. All the house types are different. And so everything fits in, into the matrix, but everything is really different. Same thing on a very large scale. I think this is the last slide. No, there's another. But this one is not so interesting. So the, the main idea here is to bring to the, um, to the discussion the idea of bringing a, a composition matrix, okay? It would be interesting to separate how you manipulate the composition matrix uh, from the generation of the house types. As something, one should fit the other, but if we change the other, the other one also changes. Could be something interesting. So just uh, for you to think. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, I think this is interesting because it's related with uh, House customization, it's uh, exactly the topic of uh, Jose Edward's uh, thesis, but it's also the topic of, uh, um, of some research that uh, we did, of some um, design studio programs that we, uh, we developed here before. And it was also the topic of some of my projects at the office uh, some years ago. Uh, so I have a lot of personal designs that uh, focused on this kind of thing, you know, mess house customization. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Because then I prefer or kind of invite you to go internal and inspire. Yeah. Once we go down the bottom, it's just quite shocking. And I mean, I, I think that the Abermatic tools are my are very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Because they they uh, uh, start relation and um, and they leave they leave a form. Yeah. Yeah, it's like um, that actually explains why shape grammars didn't um, succeed that well, in the sense that um, a shape grammar implies a design language. Uh, behind the use of it. So uh, anybody who feels uh, constrained to, um, uh, to be forced to, 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 to fit their de designs in, into, uh, into a particular language will react against that software or even concept, whatever. Um, and that's the powerful thing about the, the concept of supports. It's just an abstract concept, abstract enough not to, uh, um, to choke uh, creativity. And it leaves space for any designer to develop his or her uh, um, design language. Not, I don't yeah. agree completely yeah. with that, because one thing that uh, Habraken says is very clear about this: the support is the th a theme for design, and the infill packages are also a theme for design. So the language of the building becomes the result of the design of the support and also the design of the infill packages. Of the design of the support and the design of the infill packages. Some of the models of integrate the But in this case, what is said is that you can design the grid. What is being said is that you should design a grid with a particular idea or with a particular order. It, it means that only there is a meaning behind that grid. But you're designing on a grid, okay? You design the grid, you define how the order fits the grid, and then you design the infill packages and how they can fit your support. In a way, I think that uh, uh, if you start from scratch, the sooner the package is much higher. Uh, this is simplifying a lot the, the, the classification. It leaves out uh, some possibilities, like the same possibility that we found uh, in, uh, in Marrakech, for example. Yep. Out, uh, 
There's, uh, th there's some space for interpretation, okay? Let's imagine that those uh, zones or stripes are not completely uh, um, linear, okay? Let's imagine that your stripes have a different kind of shape, okay? Conceptually, it's still the same, and you can be placing your nucleus in areas like this, okay? Conceptually, it's the same idea. And then you can also work with some balconies here. Again, the same thing. If you get to a point that you embed the concept so well, you can, uh, 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 you, you can sketch designs very fast and explore ideas very fast. Always uh, uh, keeping up this in mind. Of course, uh, I believe that the application of, of supports makes sense every time we're talking about collective housing, uh, mass construction, something where we need, uh, in, in face of the quantity, we need to make some uh, diversity, produce diversity. If we're talking about just designing a, a, a single house, one family house, it's not necessary. It doesn't make any sense. We have the client, we have a particular design problem. It's a single design problem for a single person. It's like uh, um, you need a specific suit and you go to a tailor. Okay. The, the, there is a big problem with architects. Architects, if we compare with, uh, with clothing, architects want to be tailors, okay? There's no need of tailors in our society anymore. Nobody, uh, you, you know, pays for a tailor. It's too expensive to dress based on, on that. Uh, so you, you actually use the mass-produced clothes. Uh, what we're saying here is that probably there is some way of creating some diversity in this mass production uh, system. And as an example, you have those customizable uh, Nike shoes, for instance, uh, um, which can be customized on the website and you have different colors and it's the idea of mass customization. Okay. So make it still cheap enough for you to, to, to buy, uh, but make it different, make it personal. It's a compromise in something in between. Very complex programs could be an interesting thing. Uh, for instance, if you have a very large building like and very specific like a hospital, 
where you have lots of uh, constraints, rooms that need to be next to, to each other, and very uh, a specific functional structure, then these kind of tools can be very helpful. But it's also very difficult to program because the constraints are really terrible. Uh, but it's because of that, that's the reason why architects need it more in these kind of programs than in housing programs. But there's also some design, because most of those things are built on the house in the first place, because of, I don't know, control, their positioning, their temperature. Some parts, it doesn't need to be yeah, on, the, on the ground. There is small design, there is like, interior design, there is all the well, there's space for design. There's always space for design. It's a very functional approach. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Anyway, we will bring, in the next session, we will bring other problems. No, first, first, first. Espera uh, aí, Liliana, tenho que passar aqui o microfone. I will be fast. This is my PhD structure, more or less. I am working on urban architectural emptiness of Riverside Lisbon. And uh, my research hypothesis is that emptiness can contribute on various uh, scales and level in generating quality of urban uh, space. So my subject is emptiness, spatial framework, uh, Lisbon Riverside disciplinary framework urban architectural space and, and units of observation is public space um, qualities. I have three levels. I mean, this is how uh, research is uh, developing. I have the theoretical analysis, critical synthesis and practical synthesis. On the first um, theoretical analysis, I a bit observed what kind of things I should look within the public spaces and what are perspectives, possible perspectives of observation. Then I understood that actually there is, that what I'm concerned with are people. So I, uh, I focused my, my investigation on what people want. I did uh, <clears throat> slowly, do I speak? Oh. Okay. So I did survey directed to users and um, compared it with uh, experts point of view i saw that the experts for example they think well about a lot of things but they don't they don't have a like wide point of view so i uh, took uh, users responses and i i got 30 different aspects spatial aspects that further i uh, organize these six uh, categories that are it is based on theory of one and ge geographer there is they all all together they built so-called human in place but then then human in place has its uh, geographical uh, assembly level and it on the other side has it, is its human level so these are these are attributes that i get, got uh, for example in a network category there there is accessibility centrality publicness in urban architectural, there is spaciousness, openness, diversity, naturalness, light and color. 
In uh, behavioral, there is leisure, artistry, coexistence, social diversity, crowding. I didn't weight any of these attributes there. I didn't say which one is more important. Th that is what I want to, to find uh, further. So this is the matrix of, uh, of reality that I'm going to observe. We have the, these spatial imperatives. On upper level, I have human, human with their behavioral and emotional uh, relation towards space. And on the, on the bottom, I have geographical assembly as a background that, that uh, inspires or makes scenography for, for human level. So my... Uh, Idea is to, to see what is the relation between uh, geogra uh, geographic assembly level and human level. And to complicate it more, I started investigating what is the research, <laughs> what is the relation that human has with space, because I thought that it is not only phenomenological perspective that we should take uh, into consideration, that is not only uh, positivistic uh, perspective. I thought that we live our, our daily life in, in, uh, in spaces on all of this level, on invisible, invisible, on that phenomenological, on that physical. So to this matrix of reality, I added here three levels, which are outside perspective, inside perspective, and semiotic. It's not only semiotic, it's invisible perspective. And there, these, these, uh, I, then I observe these aspects from three different perspectives, the, the, the three different perspectives. And what I tell is that people, li that living space is actually combinations of, of all these perspectives. That we sometimes we have more like um, more detached uh, relation to uh, to space. In some other moments, we have uh, we have more like in place experience and so on. So I think that all of the of those things are important in understanding the quality of place. So I did. Uh, I am doing now seven uh, six case studies. Terrell Pas, Hubert Nausch, Tore de Blain, Paiva Consairo, Post de Bish, Picard Santos, on three different perspectives, trying to understand. What is the relation between this fo formal or physical or geography level with uh, with uh, human level? Because I believe that there is a pattern that if that, that if some of these uh, these here circles are in specific order or size or whatever, there is a, there is a certain uh, behavior or certain emotion that 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 place produces. And now I'm in this level. I'm doing. I'm doing left part and right part separately, and on the end, I will try to to correlate to see what is the relation if there is any. And further, I would like to see how some uh, of these perspectives, for example, invisible that we don't uh, design directly, how they influence the the behavior and emotion of specific place. So now I started, for example, I can show that I started from natural advantage level and then I, I'm discussing, for example, view that we have from the place. And this is what I call inside perspective because we are inside the space and then our vision is, um, is expanding. So I do, for example, ease of its analysis. Then further, I have the other, which is a type of contact with water, if there is a direct uh, contact <laughs> with water or not, and what kind of that contact is. Then, for example, in network category, I have accessibility. If I have out, uh, outside accessibility, where, I, where I'm uh, uh, talking about how many transport in general are acceding, uh, accessing specific place. And then I have inside accessibility, which uh, where I count exact a uh, number of accesses toward the place. And I have the third, which I call intangible accessibility. We, here it is a uh, time cons consumation, time consuming. For example, to post to the Bishpu, how many minutes I need uh, by public transportation or by foot from any other of, I did, I did this kind of, this matrix. I mean, maybe it is not the best one. Maybe I did, in, I related six, uh, points and I see if I want to do, for example, a daily tour and see these six places, how much time would I need to get to each of them from each other place? Front. 
and then I see that, for example, Torre de Boulogne, uh, it is uh, really far, and it is because it has uh, all it, it has a uh, uh, train and buses, but they don't stop immediately next to the place. Then we have to take 10 or 10 minutes or 15 minutes a walk or something. And then it is while, for example, uh, Caix Santos is uh, very central on the outside accessibility. But when we want to go to Caix Santos, we it is it has only one, it has two actually direct access. So it's outside accessibility is high, but it's inside accessibility is low. Okay, so, so that is uh, those things. The, are, I'm trying now to analyze on the metrics that I, where I have these 30 aspects in six categories and three perspectives, interior, exterior, intangible, front. And uh, I am not done with all of them yet, but for example, when I talk about equipment, what, uh, what, I, what will I, uh, See here is, for example, if certain place has specific equipment, <clears throat> it is the inside perspective. But for example, invisible perspective, I was thinking about do, uh, doing the investigation about affordances, because it's not only equipment that, that afford us possibility to sit. There are other urban elements that have possibility to be used as equipment. So, and I think that those invisible things are as, as well important in uh, in, create, in inspiring behavior or uh, influencing emotions. That's it, more or less. And and these are this is the architectural part that you all more or less know. That is about uh, oops. That is about um, openness and spaciousness. I started. Uh, investigating it. So just a second, this unblocked. Can I put now? Ah, this is uh, the, the work that uh, we done, that I done with Professor Brown. And then I started already uh, uh, understanding that there are these different two <coughs> things. If we if you observe a space from outside, we sit one way, but when we enter, some other elements start to gain importance and start to be part of our experience so that so I, that's why i took uh, these two one of these two perspectives into consideration and on the end i have this is the thing that i did uh, from survey i uh, put bigger bigger imperatives in uh, imperatives that were asked several times like more open i put it in bigger bigger letters so here, for example, we see that people in public space wanted naturalness, openness. This, in, this, this is language that I use that is now different, but uh, uh, stability, arousement. And I want, on the end, I will maybe use, after doing this uh, correlation between several uh, case studies, and when, with, when I get some results, maybe I will try to compare with what I got from people to see if there is any similarities or that's it. So I said 10 minutes, so I didn't really have to do it in 10 minutes. <laughs> Well, that, that is the reason okay. we uh, into this uh, research that we talked about. Oh. Um, I still feel that we should um, clarify something uh, related with the end of the research, what we want to have at the end, some information on how to design public spaces. So what are the geometrical features and elements that the space should contain uh, when you design it? Because you expect those uh, ge geometrical elements and, and 
Elon Musk in the Trump position to produce a free space. Mm -hmm. And that means that uh, many of the properties that you analyze are qualities that inform what kinds of qualities the spatial uh, geometry needs to have. Mm -hmm. So the physical uh, element needs to have. Um, so this, this is one possibility. There are other possibilities, like uh, when I find these particular physical characteristics, mm -hmm. what kind of uh, physical environment or qualities of the environment should I expect? Mm -hmm. So relate some qualities of the use. With qualities, physical, yeah. With its physical uh, characteristics or environments. Uh, then there is a problem that the same physical characteristics placed in a particular area, yeah. uh, in a particular geographic location, because they have different conditions in the network, because they have physical uh, um, context uh, with uh, different, different uh, landscape around, different uh, environmental conditions, all that also influences the same Shape. Yeah. Uh, so you should fix something, okay? And relate the other variables with what you fix, in the sense that, uh, okay, I just I want to learn how to design, or okay, I want to learn how to place uh, uh, something in the city, or. Uh, I want to see if a particular uh, program is fit for a particular place. So I take into consideration the physical aspects of the place. Mm -hmm. If everything is a variable, you will not get anything. Yeah. Okay. And, and the fact is that every time you look at something separately, you, have, you don't think about the rest. In fact, you fix. Uh, actually, it's not because uh, I under I already understood. For example, the, the things, the relations are w w what makes uh, place a place. Because, for example, the relation between urban architectural category and geographical and natural is w what Schultz talks a lot. Because he tells exactly that if we put the same architecture on urban space in different contexts, we will get completely different character. And it is in those. I think that we got uh, substance of place and then in, the, in those relations between categories. And I, I, I know that I would have to fix it. I thought first to finish, to finish this huge matrix and then to try to do data man, mining and to see if it, what will I get. And then I can, for example, from this matrix, I can take out architectural and urban and see how they correlate to the others. I can take. Uh, yeah, no, I am on. And you can, you can extract many things out of that one case. So if you see the clustering, yeah. you can correlate behavior with certain physical properties. Okay. That could be used as a matrix. Try to find correlations between uh, certain qualities of, of the space that you gather somehow mm -hmm. and uh, certain uh, physical properties. Um, another way is to find out which is the most important aspect. Then you can use another met uh, methodology, uh, uh, which is finding the, uh, the principal component. Mm -hmm. then you will find that, that certain arrangements of space, mm -hmm. of certain types, certain classes, uh, have a particular uh, component that really influences that. So yeah. that would be, let's say, the most important aspect to design or to make decisions about. Yeah, or to evaluate. Yeah. Uh, so um, you still have everything, 
have everything open until you can go in any direction. That's no, the problem. But I will first. I want to finish these case studies with uh, to thirty aspects, three perspe three perspectives, and then I will um, see what what happens. So just to finish the complex ensemble void models to show that again. Uh -huh. uh, um, it's something that uh, maybe we could show a little bit more detail at a certain point. Uh, maybe for the next uh, mm -hmm. uh, meeting, uh, yeah, yeah. because it, it is a very specific model where uh, a representation of open space is developed. And we first have two problems. So the first problem, the most important one, is how to represent space and the scale of the representation, which is something that you find in this slide. The, the, the one above has a scale of representation, the other one below has a more detailed scale of and of course, the results of the analysis are different yeah. uh, because they're focused at a different uh, scale level. Uh, then we can uh, represent, and from the properties of the uh, geometrical properties of the model, we can extract a lot of other properties, like is the space very open, very closed, uh, and, and uh, meanings associated. Then there is another step above where we pick up these uh, isolated spaces and we aggregate them uh, according to a uh, um, uh, simple algorithm which basically uses the, the continuity of spaces and uh, let's say um, uh, big steps in, in terms of the change of geometry. So we get from uh, uh, smaller uh, uh, linear spaces and suddenly we enter a very large space, then we make a break. But the way the spaces are aggregated, it basically defines, it defines let's say, continuous streets, even if they are uh, uh, winding streets or, 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 or very straight uh, continuous streets. Uh, it isolates the, 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 um, the squares, even if they are reasonably complex shapes. So the, the, the algorithm more or less isolates these spaces. Uh, and that's what we call solid models. And these are models of these kinds of spaces. And these models are composed with uh, convex spaces, which are the isolated convex uh, yes. components of, uh, of these spaces. Mm -hmm. and, and then we can start counting how many convex spaces the solid one contains. Uh, and how they fit together. Um, and also we can consider all the solid voids together, how many they cross each other into nothing. Meaning that we can start talking about topological relations of space based on topological relations of the solid voids. Uh, we still need to do a lot of work on this, calculate properties and correlate those properties with uh, behavioral aspects. So there, there should be a crossover of uh, theory between the mathematical model of all these things that we are calculating mm -hmm. and the theory, the basic depth theory, and other new developments in theory using the other aspects of the Yeah, theory. yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is very interesting line of work. There is a problem here. I would say that this will take 10 years to get to exhaustion. To, co to cons okay. consolidate it. So you, you don't, you, you should not uh, think of, of this as a goal for your PhD. Because I, uh, otherwise you will end in 10 years. But uh, the first thing you should do is to, to fix and focus the most generic things about this. First of all, how to draw or define the two levels of scale. Yeah. And I would say first, the first level of scale that we work on, which is more generic. Yeah. Model. And work with that until we get the calculation of properties of the geometrical model. 
but then there will be a lot of healing that you need to build up out of that. There are things that, by analogy with uh, extensive tax, you can point out that will be important. Connectivity of the solid void with other solid voids. Continuity of the solid void. Yeah. How many complex uh, spaces? But what, what is interesting for me, for example, in this level is that I can use as well the difference between, uh, between re re resolution to see what is the density of, of uh, some space. For example, if I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I understand. But, but I th this is the same space. It is, it is like this contains this. It is just uh, that they are in, uh, presented separately. <laughs> yeah, but because the whole thing starts by 
convex space. Drawing the model requires uh, implementation. Yeah. And that's where the ambiguity lies. <laughs> I know. Uh, By eliminating it. By eliminating <laughs> ambiguity as much as possible. And then, <laughs> the best thing you can do to, to, to make it uh, really powerful is to share the model from the moment you consider this is done. Okay? Yeah. You share the model with all the community that you know so that everybody uses the same model. In, uh, what you get with that is that. You can get comparable uh, uh, research if everybody works with the same model. If somebody decides, no, my interpretation of the, uh, uh, of the first representation is a little bit different, then, for instance, in terms of topology, it can be completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, the graph description can be completely different. Then the meaning, of course, can be completely different. And then you don't have comparable research. So the best thing in uh, uh, when you work with something that has a level of ambiguity at the starting point is to share the starting point. So that everybody can do research with the same uh, 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 with the same model. Yeah. Maybe we should as well uh, calculate the level of ambiguity. And then prove that's that also this. this, this. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting process. <laughs> yeah. The, how yeah, how it is. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>